it's hard to follow all of that, but uh, God is good. So I'm gonna, I want to share my testimony, and I'm going to share a little bit, piggybacking on your message, because it naturally fits, um, share a little bit of my testimony, and then talk about, in relationships, the impossibility of keeping those relationships without the Messiah, mm-hmm. without the Father God. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, my testimony. I was raised in an Italian Catholic family in the heartlands of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, as you can tell by my Holy Ghost accent, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Mother and father loved each other. Matter of fact, literally to the day my mother died, my father was still squeezing her. And she died at 72. He died when he was uh, 84. And God was good. He, or, or 82, I forget the age, but it doesn't matter. Um, God was good that he gave them a happy life together, and uh, they were wonderful parents. I, I have no regrets. Oh, gee, I wish we had it then. Well, it might have been nice if we had a little bit more money, but that's so superfluous. I really had loving parents. I had loving grandparents. I had most amazing grandparents. Um, uh, my grandfather, uh, he was a rough guy. He, my fellow Brooklyn, now you'll understand this. During Prohibition, my grandfather owned two speakeasies in New York City. Uh, he taught his 17-year-old bride how to make beer in the bathtub <laughs> and how to make uh, scotch in the bathtub. And that's, he was a rough and tumble guy, but uh, he was the most loving grandfather I had. So I had a great childhood. I never did drugs. Sister, I identify with you. I never did drugs. I, I don't even know what marijuana tastes like. I never did any other drugs. I had one, I'm not missing anything, I know. But I had one friend slip me some mescaline during a concert we were playing in. I thought it was the funniest thing, and I didn't like any of it. Because it's like, I don't like him high. I'm crazy sober. Could you imagine me high? I would be dangerous. Oh my goodness. But my sin. Because we all have sins. We all fall short of God's yeah. glory. Nobody is so perfect. No one thinks that. My sin was I had a lot of hatred. Mm-hmm. I hated Joe Franco. Mm-hmm. He couldn't stand me. I just hated me. I was the shortest kid on the block. I was the skinniest kid on the block. Now you can't tell. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm full gospel now. But back then, I was, I was tiny. And I was the runt. And everybody picked on me because they could. And, and I used my humor to get out of a lot of fights. I was, I was teasing, Pe- teasing Pastor Steve before. I said, I'm not afraid of a guy like you. I always beat guys like you in a fight. He said, well, it's good you know how to take care of yourself. I said, no. I bleed all over the person and they get disgusted and walk away. So I went. But that was me. I was not a fighter and I was very insecure. I hated me. And growing up, I always felt like... I knew my mother loved me, I knew my father loved me, I knew my family loved me, but I felt unwanted. And not that they ever did anything to even show me that. They never said anything to me like, hey, we really don't want you, Joey. I never felt that way at all. But it was just this annoying thing in my spirit. Well, my freshman year of high school, I go to a Catholic high school in Manhattan, Power Memorial Academy. Anybody's a basketball fan, that's where Lou Alcindo went. Uh, later to become Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And um, I got a scholarship to go to the school, and my freshman first day, first day of class, the last class of the day was religion. And I was raised a Roman Catholic, very religious family, so I knew everything about Catholicism. I knew everything about God, I thought. And when I walked in there, Brother Lawrence is standing there with a garbage pail and books of our um, religion books. He says, Put your name in the book and throw it in the garbage pail. Okay, so I wrote my name. Joseph R. Franco, the mm-hmm. garbage bag. And after we all sit down, we're like, why do we do that? And he said, at the end of the semester, I have to give you four questions that are out of that book. Two weeks before the classes are over, we'll take the books out of the garbage pail, I'll teach you the four questions, and I'll give you the four answers, because the whole rest of the semester, we're going to study the Bible. Mm-hmm. This is a Catholic school, by the way. We've never read the Bible before. Catholics don't read the Bible, only priests are allowed to read the Bible. That's why I was, I was told. And lo and behold, I fell in love with the Word of God. It was so cool. And this man didn't teach us religion. He taught us the Word. Amen. And it was so much fun. Amen. I loved reading the Word. It still is fun, but it was so much fun. And at the end of that freshman year, I wanted more. And so then during that summer, 
I ran into Jehovah's Witnesses who came to the house. And they made it seem like, hey, this could be a great place to go because we studied the Bible, we talk about the Bible. And so I went to my mom and I says, Mom, I really want to go to that Bible study because there's no Bible study. The Catholic Church doesn't do Bible study. And they just didn't do that. And she said, Joey, don't go there. They don't teach the right God. So my mother gave me good advice. I stayed away. Fast forward to December. My brother starts going to a Bible study for teenagers at this Reformed church in my community. Our, our, our neighborhood was like 80% Italian, 19.5% Jewish, and one Scottish family. That was it. And I didn't know there were other people besides Italians and Jews. You know, I, I, when I saw a, a black person, are they Italian? Because I, 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 they, they don't look, you don't look Jewish. So, black Italian, that's it, there we go. Black Jew. Black Jews. Well, they're all black Jews. I found that afterwards. But my brother said one night, why don't you come down? There's a lot of cute girls there. So I went. Because I'm 15 years old and what's on my mind? Baseball and girls. And this is the winter. No more baseball. Now it's girls. And so I went down there and it was, I'll never forget that night. It was 17 degrees outside. Light snow coming down. Wind from the northwest at three miles an hour. I could tell you everything. I could tell you what I was wearing. I remember that night so beautifully. And we get to this church, and it's this big Gothic church, and people are standing outside singing Christmas carols. So I join them, I see my brother, and I'm joining all these kids, and we're singing Christmas carols. And there's a living nativity. And I said, why are they doing that? They're standing outside in this cold, it's 17 degrees. Mm. Why are they standing outside in the cold and looking at this doll of Jesus? That guy didn't have a baby, real baby out in the cold <laughs> weather. That would be child abuse. But they had this... They're looking at this doll like it was the real baby Jesus. I'm like, why are they doing that? And one of the ladies said, well, we want to be a witness to the neighborhood. So I said, witness? Somebody commit a crime? <laughs> I didn't understand Christian lingo. I didn't learn the language. I didn't have to, I didn't have to get a lingo card. <laughs> and so she said, She's, go inside and have some hot apple cider. So I went inside, and there I saw this pretty girl. I'm going, oh. I want to get her number. And Jesus used her to get my number because she shared what Jesus did in her life, how he changed her life, how he took her out of a life of drugs and promiscuity and cleansed her. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there like, what? Jesus cleansed you? I mean, I believe he did miracles in the Bible, but he does it today. And she says, yeah, he tells me every day he loved me. I'm going to wait. He talks to you? Are you kidding? He speaks to you? And she's like, yeah. He, he tells me every day he loves me. He's forgiven me and it's all forgotten. And I don't have to remind him. Forgive me, Jesus. It's done. It's over. Mm. And I walked home upset. I'm like, how can they didn't teach me this in my church? So I get home and I go to bed and it's 11.45 at night. A lot of things happen in my life at 11.45 at night. I lay in bed. And I said, Father... I want what Debbie has. And she said, all I have to do is ask Jesus into my heart. So Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you as my Savior. And there was no parting of the ceiling and a hand coming down, patting my head. None of that. But this peace filled my heart. Amen. And I woke up that next morning full of a joy that I never had. Now, mind you, I still didn't like this guy very much. But I started feeling a little guilty about that. Wait, wait. Jesus loves me. Why am I angry? And over a three-year period, he slowly chipped away at all the hurts and all the angers. And it was like a weekly basis. I'd be reminded of something that hurt me when I was a kid. I'd give it to him and I'd be healed. And God was so good. I stayed in the Catholic Church because I was 15 years old because I was I'd be obedient to my mother. Uh, Friday night, go to the Dutch Reformed Church for a Bible study. Sunday morning, go to St. Rosalia's Catholic Church. And Sunday night, go to Calvary Tabernacle, which was the Assemblies of God Pentecostal Church. Mm -hmm. So I had Reformed Assemblies of God Catholic doctrines going through my head. So when people ask me, what's your theology? I go, yes. <laughs> Are you a Calvinist? Sure. Are you Arminian? Yeah. How could you be? I don't know. I, I see both sides. I see they're both crazy. I see both right. It doesn't matter. What I was taught is that Jesus saves, and it's our job to tell that to others. All the other doctrinal things, I don't get involved in, because that's their problem. My problem is I want to tell people who are lost 
Jesus saves. And that's what changed my life on December 17th, 1971. In January 73 at 11.45 at night after a Tuesday night prayer meeting with all my friends are filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs going, okay, what's wrong here? Why am I the only one that's not filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with that joy? So I went back at home at night at 11.45 I said, Father God, I want the Holy Spirit. And immediately started speaking in tongues and laughing at the same time because my brother was in the other bed we shared a bunch of commie yeah, Bible readings, people and that. Just come one, one Wednesday night, because our prayer meeting was a charismatic prayer meeting. People getting saved left and right. So one night, we're all having dinner, and he says, I'm coming tonight to the prayer meeting. So we're like, oh, okay, great, we're excited. So we come down, we have our worship, we're praising the Lord. He's sitting there, just clapping and smiling, and being a good boy. I don't think he's buying any, into any of this yet. And he said, well, now we're going to have our preacher, and we're going to have Brother Joe Franco share the word. And so I get up, and I turn and look at him, and his mouth is like... <laughs> <laughs> so I look at him and go, you got a problem with this? He's like, no, I'm like 19 at the time. So I get up there, and I just share the word. I have no idea, I don't remember what I shared. He gets saved. Please, God. Yeah, he gets saved. Thank you, Jesus. But the best is that I'm hugging him, I'm crying. He's crying. He says, I have to tell you something. I said, what? You know why I came tonight? I said... You wanted to come to the prayer meeting. No, I came to argue with the preacher. Oh. <laughs> he says, oh, no. So why did George argue with me? So I don't want to look like an idiot. No. <laughs> so I just sat there and it finally made sense. I said, well, praise God, Dad. So mm -hmm. Daddy got saved. Oh, God. Fast forward, I was um, I got married in 79 to my, my first wife, Anita, and we were married for 13 years and on December 21st of 1991, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And an interesting thing, December 21st, 1991, I didn't know her, but that was her 16th birthday. Hmm. Really strange thing. Mm. Now, the little coincidence there. Is that a coincidence, guy? You're trying to tell me something. In 1992, she passed away, and we were in youth ministry. I was a youth pastor. She was assisting me in youth, and when she died, I got angry. I'm going to be honest, and thank you for being transparent, brother, today. I got angry at God, and I backslid. I backslid. Somebody made a joke with me. you got to be careful what jokes you tell people. I try to joke and not try to bring people down. Somebody once was, I was really upset, it was Christmas time. I said, Joe, you need a 21-year-old with no morals. And the next day I met one. And I backslid. And for 18 months I walked away from God. But when I came back to him, it was like nothing was lost. Um, it, was, it was a Saturday night. I was at this girl's house. We're having a big party. And it's 4 o'clock in the morning. And I'm supposed to spend the night with this girl. And I hear clear as day in my head, Joey, get out now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even like, Joe, I don't think you belong here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes we picture, you know, we picture Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. As this meek and holy little lamb. I had the lion of the tribe of Judah in my ear saying, get out, Joey, now. I get up. And I'm like, where are you going? I got to go home. My father called. I don't have a cell phone. Wait, how did he call you? You, you have a cell phone? No, but he's calling. I gotta go. <laughs> and this girl told me, like, I says, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I would love to stay, but dad's calling. You wouldn't understand. I gotta go. So I go home, and by the time I get home, it's 4:45 at night, and I go, I fall straight, to, straight to sleep in bed. I just crash, hit the bed. I wake up at nine o'clock, like I slept for 12 hours. Hmm. I go, okay, Lord, what now? Go to church. So I go back to my old church I hadn't been to in like five years back to my church and I repent that morning that night the pastor says hey listen I hear you're really good with youth I need some help with my youth ministry and I said you want me to work with your youth he's like yeah why I says you have no idea what it's doing last night and you want me to work with your kids now he said did you come to the altar and repent I said yes I did he said well it's all covered under the sea of forgetfulness so go back to work and there you go. Three years later, uh, a year later, I meet this young lady who came to my youth Bible study, and uh, we became best of friends. And uh, 
She forced me to marry her. I really didn't yeah. want to. I, I, she wasn't my type. She was too pretty. I liked them really ugly. But um, I settled and I, I married her. No, it's funny because when Michelle, when we first fell in love, she says, you, you know, you're not my type. I says, I know, I'm way too handsome for you. All your boyfriends are ugly. No, that girl, she had some gorgeous boyfriends. I would have gone out with them, not straight. But God put us together and joined us together, and we got married 18 years ago, and it's been wonderful. Give her a hand for putting her together 18 years. But, you know, being married, and for those of us who are married, because most of us here, and even if you're not married, Society gives this image of what the ideal husband and wife should look like. Mm -hmm. Everything is perfect, mm -hmm. right? Always agree. Wives, you never disagree with your husband, Why, right? You never disagree. No one is shaking their heads out there in Facebook land and TV land. Um, they're always, everything's always all right. Everything's wonderful. The bank account has over $200,000 at all times in it. When it goes below two hundred thousand dollars, it just comes magically appears in there. Yes, everything's fine. The mortgage is paid off. The bills are paid. Even the dog never has bitten the mailman. Uh, nothing's ever wrong. The kids always behave. They're always loving, and the children are always serving God. <laughs> it's like leaving the beaver means father knows best. And folks, to be honest, most of us men we're like Al Bundy. <laughs> We're like Al Bundy for married with children. We try our best, but no matter how hard we try, we fall and hit ourselves in the face. And it's, we sit on that couch like this. I'm not going to sit like Al because it's on TV, we have a video, but Al just sit there and we live in our lives in quiet desperation. And wives, I've never seen my wife creep me at the door. And thank God you've never done this, honey. Greet me at the door and say, Welcome home, my lord. Here is your favorite beverage. Sit down while I take you, your shoes off and bring you your slippers. She's never done that. If she ever did that, I knew something would be wrong. Okay, you set the house on fire, the roof collapsed. What's going on? But the results of that, I mean, TV and movies puts this image, and uh -huh. sometimes, sad to say, churches put this image. Yeah. That the perfect family. I mean, I, I, I'm. And thank God, I, I love the pastor here. Steve and, and Tina, I love them, they're real. Right. But I've been in churches where, oh, that pastor's family, they're perfect. And the children are always so perfect. And meanwhile, you know what's going on behind the scenes, but no one ever says it. And they put that pressure on people, and as a result, marriages are suffering. Because you go home, and I'm like, how come you're not like that pastor? It's not my fault. <laughs> The divorce rate in this country is interesting. After 10 years of marriage, 70% of the marriages actually do last. When they hit the 20 year mark, only between 52 and 56% of the marriages last. And it makes you wonder, is it because the kids are older now? Mm -hmm. And the parents are like, okay, it's enough with the facade, the kids see right through us, they know we hate each other, we're getting out of here. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of different issues that people deal with in marriage, money issues, the pressures of, uh, of, of, of all the nonsense going on in the world. But it boils down to two words that appear in Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Yeah. And like I said, I was laughing this morning when Steve started reading, and I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> I have to rewrite this whole thing. And it was wonderful because it, it, you delivered it so beautifully, brother. And if you missed it, folks, on Facebook this morning, watch the video. Because it was a wonderful message, and he was just so real and right up front. And that's, that's a blessing. But Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 33 says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. For the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Messiah, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For well, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it as it refers to Messiah and his bride, the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Two key words in there. Wives submit. Husbands love. Now what is submission? Submission, I'll tell you what submission isn't first. Submission is not agreeing on everything. Ladies, God doesn't want you to be a puppet. Go, yes dear. Yes, dear. Sometimes I wish my, wish my wife would say yes, dear. But she's a very Jewish woman. What do you want? That's what she said. I'm quoting her. It's not my words. Her words. But submission is not agreeing on everything. For instance, as believers, if God is speaking to your heart, ladies, and he's not speaking to your husband's heart, you have that God-given right to say you're doing the wrong thing. You have that God-given right because you are a child of the king. You're his princess. And he might be a prince of God, but you're his princess. And you better speak into his life. He needs to hear that. Especially if a wife is married to a person who's an unbeliever who says, you're not supposed to go to church. you got to submit to me. Mm. Yes, I'm supposed to submit you to you is the right answer. But in this, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Because Yeshua, Jesus, supersedes the relationship with him. Because your husband does not get you into heaven. Right. Jesus does. Right. So submission is not agreeing on everything. It's a two-way street. Where the husbands, husbands who do not listen to their wives are dumb. <laughs> You're dumb. <laughs> dumb. Dumb. And I say one more scriptural word. You're dumb. <laughs> because God, we might be the head of the house, but she's the heart. What verse is that again? Uh, that's the Joey Standard Version of Ephesians 5. The Joey Franco Standard Version. You can pick it up on Amazon. <laughs> Submission doesn't mean agreeing with your husband on everything. You can share your opinion. Sometimes I wish my wife would agree with me on one little thing. I'm teasing you, honey. I'm just going to tease my wife now. This is my I'll try time. To She'll deal with me later. <laughs> Submission also does not mean leaving your brain at the altar. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. God has given you wonderful brains, and women do think differently than men. Amen. You genetically, it's a genetic thing. You see things different than men. We analyze, and we're going to go, we, men, we just want to fix it and solve it and solve it. Ladies will talk about it for three days, <laughs> but you'll come up with the best answer. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll be banging on the other, let's fix this this way. No, we got to do that. And then the lady's going to go, no, just, just do this. Oh. I hate when she's right. But submission doesn't mean leaving your brain at the altar. Submission means, ladies, it's okay to share what God has put on your heart. It's okay to share your experience in a certain area. It, when it comes to music, as you heard, I'm not the greatest singer in the world. I'm married to one of them, but I am not. And she's had to give me a lot of little different tips when we had to do some singing engagements together. And then, you know, she's the anointed one, I'm the annoying one. But <laughs> we, we, we blend well together. If she had left her brain at the altar, she'd just blindly let me do what I want to do, and I'd sound really bad. So submission, it doesn't mean leaving your brain at the altar. As the leaders of the home, we have to take that initiative to listen to our wives, because they have smart things to say. Amen. Submission does not mean that you do not try to influence your husband. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's a problem for any woman I've ever met. But I still want to say, because sometimes women feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't butt in. No, it's okay, ladies. Mm -hmm. It's okay, ladies, to butt in. 
even in an area where you think, oh, he's the expert. Because many times she said some things passing about a message, and I'm like, oh, maybe I should try that. Uh, especially when we were doing youth work, she would just say, Joey, why don't you try this with the youth? And I'm like, all right, I'll try it. And we'd see kids' lives get changed just because I listened to her really silly little idea that she had. <laughs> Submission is not putting the will of the husband before the will of Messiah. Messiah has to be number one in the relationship for you ladies. He has to be. Because if he's not, you're putting him as God. That's and that's a bad position to be in. As a man, I don't want Michelle to worship me. As a man, I don't want Michelle putting me ahead of Yeshua. Because our God is a jealous God. And he has no problem knocking me down a peg or two for her sake. For her sake, it would be good for me. I'm like, how oh, did you have to do that, Lord? It wasn't me, it was her. But it sounds like Adam. The wife you gave me, she's the one who did it. And then the woman said, the devil made me do it. It said in the, in the Garden of Eden, the only person with integrity besides God was the devil. He didn't give an excuse because he was just being himself. He didn't have a leg to stand on. That's right. He didn't have a leg to stand on. Oh, 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 oh very good. good. Oh, like okay, two points for Tanny. Very good. Very good. The devil did not have a leg to stand on in the Garden. It's true. Submission is not putting the will of the husband before the will of the Messiah. Number five, submission does not mean getting all of her spiritual strength through her husband. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's not from your hubbies. No. And men, conversely, especially in today's society, there are more men who don't want to take the lead in the house, let the wife, let the wife be the one to lead, and I'll just follow along. And what a man, man be pan be men in this world. And 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 Unfortunately, none of them are here, but yeah. they're out there. I mean, all these men sitting here, I can see, you're the head of your household, and that's beautiful. It's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. But a lot of men, they put, they put the wife first. Let the wife take care of the teaching the kids the Bible. Let the wife take the kids to church. Let the wife do this, let the wife do that. And then we have an emasculated society of men who just don't want to take that rightful responsibility of leading their family. And I'm not talking about men being dictators, but I'll talk about what God wants from the men in a few minutes. Submission does not mean living or acting in fear. When a woman lives in fear of her husband, that's a sad day. Because the last person you should ever be afraid of yeah. is your hubby. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're afraid of me, are you? No, I'm afraid of disappointing you. That's about it. That's about it. That's good. Because we ever got the fight, she beat me up. I know. She <laughs> beat me. She's tough. I'm not. I'm afraid of her. I'm afraid of my wife. Five foot one. I'm afraid of her. But submission. What that is? It's putting yourself in rank under another person. Mm -hmm. That in the relationship, honey, as the wife, the wife would tell the husband, honey, you're in charge. You make the final responsibility. Because as a man, we have to make that final decision. The responsibility is on our back. But God's wonderful. He does see us through that. And how many men, can we say an amen that God has seen us through things that we had no idea what to do, but when we listened to him, right. it fell through and it came through perfectly. Yeah. Submission is looking to meet the needs of the other before you meet your own needs. Yeah. It's adapting that servant lifestyle. I'm here to bless you, sweetheart. And it's to trust the other person to lead. And that's a hard thing, especially in our society that's preaching. I mean, society today is preaching, women, make your own decision. Don't have to tell your husband everything. Have your own bank account separate from him and don't tell him about it. And that works for the society, but it, I don't think it's working for society because all of society is messed up. And people don't believe me if that society is, they think it's not messed up. Read the news. <laughs> People shooting each other, people killing each other. I'm not talking about terrorists. I'm talking about at home. People killing people because they got men on the job at their boss and they go kill the person. Where's God in that person's life? Our society needs God more than anything else. Our society needs Jesus in their lives. Because without Jesus, people are facing an eternity of no hope. And what they're doing is absolutely insane that they want to go forth. I'm mad at you. Boom. Mm. What? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
be a man and find out what went wrong. And if you did something wrong on the job and that's why they're letting you go, don't do it again on the next one. Right. Learn it. Right. There's been many times I thought I was doing the right thing and then my boss like, get over here. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. It takes a man to say I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. It takes a coward to pull a gun out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, all these rules of uh, wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your wives, that's all a result after the fall, especially a submission, because after the fall, God was looking at the woman going, now you've got to submit to him, because you messed up. He told you not to eat that fruit, mm -hmm. and you ate it. <laughs> and the devil knew, go to her, because she wasn't there when God told man, do not eat of this fruit. So Adam had to teach her, but she wasn't there, so... You're not going to die, said the devil. No, not yet. But when she ate it, she spiritually died. Yeah. And then God put, hey, you know, you're going to have a hard time. Because she's going to be rebellious at all times. And you're going to have to work hard. Because you let that devil seduce her. You let that devil deceive her. Because it said the man was with her. It wasn't like he was like, what are you talking to, honey? Ah, okay. Say hello. He wasn't too. He was right there next to her. Wow. Then it says, husbands, love your wives mm -hmm. as Messiah loves the church. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to summarize what that means. We have to love her heart. You have to give her emotional love. You have to love her mind. Give her intellectual love. You have to love her body. Give her the physical love. You have to love her soul. Give her that spiritual love. You have to love her relationship-wise. You have to be make her your best friend. You have to love her humanity, just her personality itself, what she wants to accomplish in this world that we live in. You love that, that realistic love. You have to love the calling that God has put on her life, a supportive love. And you have to love her maker, that he made her just the way she is. Oh, I wish she was like this. No, you can't do that. God made her that way. He made her a help meet for you. He made Eve a help meet for Adam, mm -hmm. and she would have been a horrible help meet for anybody else. Mm -hmm. He made Michelle a help meet for me. She'd be terrible for somebody else. Mm -hmm. She was picked for me. Mm -hmm. So I gotta love her. And I gotta love the God that made her. But looking at what's on a woman, you gotta do this, and what's on a man, you gotta do that. It's impossible. So we think that. See, why would God give us a commandment if it's not something we can do? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Well, in Proverbs 31, I want to read this to you. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 31 from 10 to the end, it talks about the excellent wife. Mm -hmm. And when you read this, sort of like a, a report card of the excellent wife, like a tick sheet, the heart of her husband trusts her. She does it good, not harm. Mm -hmm. She seeks woolen flats. I'm summarizing. Mm -hmm. She's like the ships to the merchants. She brings food from afar. She rises while yet not provides food for her household and portions for her maiden. You read all this and going, that's the perfect woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a woman, but the ladies, do you ever feel like you fall short? Be honest. Not Michelle, but everybody else, right? <laughs> no, seriously. That's a hard thing to live, live up to. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. That means she weaves her own clothing. Mm -hmm. Honey, you weave clothes to me. <laughs> That's a hard thing to live up to. Yeah. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. That's why I moved to Florida. I hate snow. <laughs> she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. All this stuff that it talks about this woman and her children called her blessed, her husband worships the ground she walks on. It's all amazing. But I love verse 30, and here is the hope, ladies and gentlemen. We can take this for ourselves, because in Messiah there is no male or female. We're all one in Messiah. Here is the hope. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Sister Andrine, that was perfect when you said, he could be good looking, but that don't matter. She can be gorgeous. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. She she could make she can make Holly Berry look ugly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. That's fleeting. Those days of being handsome or being beautiful, 
they eventually will yes, fall right. away. Mm -hmm. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. I'm one of the few guys that's had, gotten better looking with age, I must <laughs> say. But seriously, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But here's the key. But a woman who fears the Lord right. is to be praised. Amen. Not the woman who sows. Mm -hmm. Not the woman who keeps the perfect house. Mm -hmm. Not the woman who keeps the perfect uh, ships. Not the woman who does all this other stuff. Makes her own home. Yeah. The woman to be praised is the one who fears the Lord. And that is our comfort. Men and women. Hmm. Because I claim that for us men. The man who fears the Lord, he's to be praised. Amen. Okay, maybe you don't make as much money as you'd like to. Mm -hmm. You fear the Lord, that's what matters. Because the money can go in a, in a minute like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe your kids, eh, they clothes, they look a little weathered and torn. Do you fear the Lord? What's that? Or oh, don't fit. <laughs> Do you fear the Lord? That's what matters in the grand scheme of things, at the end of it all, we were talking, Jeff and I were talking before, when God greets us when we get into glory, he's not going to say, well done, thy good and faithful sower. Mm -hmm. Well done, thy good and faithful decorator of your home. Well done, that good and faithful uh, cool. successful man in business who made a lot of money for the family. Well done, thy good and faithful pastor who built a big cathedral. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. God wants to see that servant's heart. Mm -hmm. And if we're serving God and we fear the Lord, that's what matters. So my word for the married couples and the unmarried couples thinking of getting married, and for those who weren't married and it didn't work the first time, and for those who were widows or widowers, my word for you is this. If you have God first... That's all that matters. Amen. Everything else really Amen. is superfluous. Because at the end of life, when they take you away in that hearse, there's never a U-Haul truck behind them so you can take all the stuff with you. You can't take it with you. All that one, all that's on earth, it's, it's meaningless when it comes to eternity. What's done for Messiah, that's what lasts. Amen. Now, talking about parents, as a parent. The tough thing is when you're a parent, kids are a challenge. Because we're being pulled in all different directions, just as a daddy. You know, I gotta make sure the bill's paid. I gotta make sure uh, there's food in the refrigerator. I gotta make sure there's clothes on the kid's back, clothes that fit them. They gotta make sure that my wife is happy. I gotta make sure that the family's fed. It's a lot of pressure. And society will tell you, make more money, go make more money, make more money. And it would be nice to make more money, but sometimes it's just not possible. Yeah. Because the way society is today, unless you're putting a 60, 80 hour a week on two or three different jobs, it's, it's kind of hard. And for me, when I come home at night, I want to spend it with my wife. I want to spend it with my kids. I don't like my kids. I don't love them. I love my Bella. I love my Micah. And if they're watching, I miss you guys a whole lot. And maybe next time we come out here, you'll come with us. But I love my kids more than anything else in this world. Take my foot, I don't care. Take my both feet, I don't care. I got my kids, I'm fine. I love my kids. And as a daddy, I got to sacrifice sometimes. Maybe want to get an extra job because I want to be with them. I'm 61, they're nine and six. I'm gonna be with them. I don't have that luxury of thinking, oh, I got plenty of time. I don't, but that's okay. Because I'm loving every second I'm with those little munchkins. But there's one thing, I saw this on the internet a few years ago and I printed it out and stuck it in a corner in a drawer and I hadn't seen it since then. And as we were leaving, I was pulling something out of my drawer to pack and luggage and this paper came out and says, okay, I'm supposed to talk about this. The 25 most mentioned things that a daughter really needs from her dad. These are things that survey was done. These are 25 things. <clears throat> can we guess what number one is? Because I know we're all tired. So can we guess what number one thing a daughter wishes her daddy would give her? Uh, no. What was that? Time. 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 You saw my notes? 
<laughs> time you were a little girl. Time. They would rather daddy just spend time with them. Sit with them. Hold them. I love my Bella. We sit on that couch sometimes. She just gets right into my arm. Now she's getting big. She's nine years old. And she's a tall nine. She's almost as tall as my wife. And she's she's not she's not a big girl, not a heavy girl. She's just a big girl. And she's just in my arm and I just was a nuzzle. And she she give me a little klutzy like her mommy. She'll like swing and smack me in the face. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I love every smack. I love every punch. I love it. She's my baby. But we spend time together. I gotta spend time with her. That's what the kids want. To show interest and involvement in my life. Or to be available. The second most mentioned thing, affirmation. Approval or praise. That hear me out and tell me I love you. Mm. Affirmation. And I try to do that at least once a day to tell Bella, Bella, I'm so proud of you. I love you and I'm so proud of you just the way you are. Bella sometimes has a hard time making friends. And it's not because she's not a friendly kid, but I think I, I was a little bit the same way. I tried a little too hard at times. I think she does that. So she's learning just to find out what people like and find interest in that, try to find a commonality. She's learning that. But I'm proud of her, because she's trying. Third thing, affection. Hugs and physical touch. Now, I grew up in a family, we're Italian, so Italian means hug, cuddle, kiss, smack around. I mean, my son, I pick him up upside down and carry him around the house and bite his cheeks, and bite his butt. I don't care. I bite everything I boy the boy kid. And he's a fighter. He knows how to fight back. But he loves it. Um, when I come home sometimes, Michelle go, ooh, daddy's home. Hi. And where do they go? They go in my bed. And so I hear that, that hi, I know what they are. So I walk in my bedroom. I hope nobody's in my bed. I want to lay down and sprawl out. I hear, you know the giggles, and they're laughing. I jump in bed. Oh, this bed is so lumpy, Daddy. It's us. <laughs> we just attack each other. I love my kids. I kiss them. I hug them. I cuddle them. You know, Bella's nine years old, and she's starting to become a little lady. So I can't hug her as much as I used to, but I still hug the the Jesus out of the girl and <laughs> hug her face and squeeze her face. They love it. They love it. An unconditional love. Mm -hmm. That you love me for who I am regardless of what I've done. Bella especially, when I reprimand her, she starts crying. Wait, baby, wait, baby, stop crying. There's no need to cry. I'm angry, but I still love you because she thinks I don't love her. When I yell at her, she thinks I don't love her. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be really careful. She's got a tender heart. So you gotta be really careful. So I tell every day, Bella, I don't care whatever you do. I still love you. It doesn't matter. I could be angry at what you did and I'm going to reprimand you and going to be punished. But I love you and I'm punishing you because I love you so you don't do that again and hurt yourself. Because you know kids, they can do things that could actually get themselves killed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Number five, a daddy who apologizes. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, Bella broke um, our fish tanks, um, the filter. And I exploded because it was 10 o'clock at night. Oh, and, you know, it was, it was nine, almost 9 o'clock at night. The fish store closed at 9 o'clock, and I ran there just in time to get a filter. And I came home. I was so angry. I was so tired. I wanted to get to bed early. I wanted to get to bed an hour later than I wanted to. And I yelled at her. And she was so upset. And so I, I got home, and after I put everything, I said, Michelle, where's Bella? She's upset. She's fine. No, she's not. I got to go upstairs. I went up and apologized. I said, Bella, I was wrong. I should never have yelled at you. She said, yeah, but I broke the filter. I said, it doesn't matter. It's a filter. $10. I'm going to freak out over a $10 filter. No, I was wrong and I apologized. Mm -hmm. And this smile comes on her face. It's okay, Daddy. No, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay. No. Instead, what I want to hear you say is, Daddy, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And she was like, and she stops watching. She says, Daddy, I forgive you. And then we were fine. You got to apologize. Sometimes men were going to mess up. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to admit that. Your yeah. child needs to hear that. Right. I'm going to quickly go through the other. Be proud of me. 
Bella loves when she does something. I go, oh, you're the best, Bella. <laughs> when they, they had VBS at a local church, and the kids went to it. And on the Friday night, they wanted the kids to repeat the story, the pineapple story. It's a 15-minute story. And she repeated it almost word for word. <laughs> she told the story, and I'm sitting there like, <laughs> and when she walked off, that she they gave her this biggest applause, and my kid, who has no shy bone in her body, is going, thank you, thank you. <laughs> sits down, and I'm laughing. <laughs> and the person who's running, she says, gee, I wonder who she gets that from, that she's so comfortable in front of a crowd. Says, Beats me, I don't know. I'm shy. I was shy at one time. But when I got about nine months old, I broke out of that shit. <laughs> what are some of those other things? Be proud of me, like I said. Tell me I'm beautiful. <laughs> Guys, you're telling your little girl she's beautiful? You got to do that. Because she needs that, especially about her looks. Women, they need to know that they're beautiful. I tease my wife all the time. You know, I tell her, people call us beauty and the beast. <laughs> and I get so upset. I think she's pretty too, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, look at her. You should be beauty and beauty. But she needs to know that I think she's gorgeous, and my daughter needs to know I think she's gorgeous. And I tease her a lot. Oh, you're looking more and more like your mother, you poor thing. And she smiles. She knows that you're doing Michelle. And she's like, I know. I'll say, Bella, who's the prettiest girl in the world? Me. Very good. Who's the second prettiest person in this house? Me. Who's the first? Mommy, no. <laughs> she doesn't believe me that I'm the prettiest, but anyhow. Talk to me and open about himself, his pain, his faults, and his hopes. My kids know about our struggles. I let them know, especially when they would say, Daddy, can we buy this? Daddy, can we buy that? No, not in the budget this month. Nope, can't do it. But why? We don't have it. Why don't we have it? Because I bought food. <laughs> I don't. I make a certain amount of money. Amen. Be real. I need to pay my mortgage. Yeah. And the taxes and everything else that goes with that. The insurance. I need to buy food. I say, you think you're going to open up the refrigerator like this? <laughs> and you're going to get nourishment? I'm going to eat. And my kids know this. And I'm, I'm glad we've been very open with our kids. When things are tight, the kids don't ask for anything. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have, you're going to have peanut butter and jelly. That's going to be good enough. Or you're going to have pasta with, with, with butter and cheese. That's going to be your dinner. And I'll, I'll add some extra cheese in it so you get more protein. But <laughs> kids, things are tight this month. Don't worry, all the bills are paying. You still got food. We're fine. The house is, the electricity won't be shut off. We're never behind. Mm -hmm. We're just floating on the water. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But my kids know this because my kids appreciate when we give them something, they really appreciate it. So it's important, daddies, mm -hmm. to be open and honest with your kids. Mm -hmm because they appreciate what little they might have. Mm -hmm. And then when you compare yourself to the third world nations, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. we have so much. I know, I know. You came, sister, from Haiti. Mm -hmm. I mean, the poorest family here could live like a, like a king mm -hmm. in some of these third world nations. So we complain, oh, my TiVo broke. What am I gonna <laughs> do? I can't film Game of Thrones. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> Another thing girls want, daddy, pursue me. You know, man, when you saw that little woman and you wanted to get to know her, actually she pursued me. I never chased her at all. No. We spent time together and you ask her and you find interest in what she likes because if you're really interested in her, you're going to be interested in what she likes. I never forget. Yankees are winning the 1996 World Series. Where were we, honey? Do you remember? We went to that concert in Lincoln Center for art songs. The place was half empty because the Yankees are winning the World Series. But I sat through art songs, three hours of art songs. Don't ask me what an art song is. I don't know. It was opera. And because she was a, music, a voice major at Manhattan School of Music. And I'm going, okay. I hope the Yankees win, Lloyd. Because even though I'm a Mets fan, I still like the Yankees. I'm like, okay, Lloyd, hope the Mets win. I open up, we open the doors, the Lincoln Center, walk out, call horns, people with Yankee flag. Okay, they won. I'm happy. And went home and I, found, I saw a replay on ESPN, so I caught most of the game. But, you know, that's 
Daughters want that from the daddy as well. So the same way you pursue your wife, guys pursue your daughters. Same way. Court her like you courted your wife. Treat her like a queen, like you treat your wife. Another thing, prayers. My kids love when we pray with them. They love it. Micah, my son Micah is six years old, going on 19. Um, he has girlfriends, and they're all older women. Um, he's got one girlfriend he's going to marry her. Uh, she's, I'm not going to mention her name on Facebook, but she is uh, 18 years old. Knocked out. Good taste, Micah. And the other one is a little bit older. He's marrying Liz because she's got a good job. So, this is my son. He's six, by the way. He is, did I say he was six? Six years old. He's a handful. I love every second of it, but he is a handful. But Micah, no matter how crazy he drives me, and no matter how bad he can be, because he's so defiant, like, okay, I'll listen to you after I have to get up and grab the wooden spoon. <laughs> then he goes right, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Micah, you got me so angry. I don't want to pray right now. No, no, pray. Grab my hand. Okay, this <laughs> pray, daddy, pray. <laughs> oh, yeah, we only spank on the butt. No, I don't hit me. He's gorgeous. I can't hit that face. But that's what the butt is there for. God put that padding there for a specific reason. And I've learned to use that spoon as the board of education being applied to the seed of knowledge. So, this is what we do. But, um, seriously, no matter how crazy he could be, no matter how angry he might even be with me because I was upset with him, Daddy, pray. And he gripped my hand. Pray. And we, we do the same prayer every night. We say, after we say our prayers, we do the, uh, I do the ironic benediction. And I have to sing it. I can't just rush through it. I have to say, Yivarechecha Adonai Vaishmarecha Yahe Adonai Panavelecha Vikunecha Isa Adonai Panavelecha Yaseemlecha Shalom which means, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Mm -hmm. It's an important prayer for children to have. Mm -hmm. And I say it every night over them because if I don't, they're upset. Mm -hmm. I get my blessing, Daddy. Mm -hmm. So you got to bless your kids in prayers. Help the kids. Be with them. Work on your own temper so that the kids can feel safe. Don't Try to change me, Daddy. That's what girls want. Another thing they don't want. They want honesty from Daddy. They want Daddy to just listen. They want guidance from Daddy. They want protection from Daddy. My kids know when we're going into a dangerous area, they have nothing to fear. I'll take it all. I'll protect them. I'll die for my kids. I'll die for my wife. Because I faced it before. And I wasn't afraid. Because I realized my God is a great God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Had nothing to do. How much more time do I have? It's 6.25. I'll, I'll end in seven minutes. Quick story. Yeah. It has nothing to do with relationships, but it has done everything to do with trusting God. I was riding the subway. We were living in New York at the time. Riding the subway home. And I'm wearing a shirt that says, Jesus is Messiah. And it said in English and in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. mm. And I'm standing there talking to one of my coworkers. And I look at this guy staring at me. He's, he's bald head and did not look like him. The nice character. Um, I mean, he had these tattoos on his face, and he just looked rough. And he looks at me, and he just mouths a foul word in my direction. <laughs> and I look at him and go, excuse me? Now, I'm five foot seven and a half. He can, I can see he was about, you know, height six foot three, six foot four. All muscle. I put my muscles here. Anyhow, I said... Excuse me, what you say? And he says his curse word in my, at me in a derogatory fashion again. I said, now why would you say that to me? You don't even know me. My name is Joe. What's your name? His name was David. I start talking to this guy. Find out he's, an, he's a hell's angel. I said, if you're a hell's angel, what do you ride the subway? Buy too much money to park the bike in the city. Um, <laughs> that's messed up. How can you? And he was a Jewish hell's angel. Now, how rare is that? Oh. I'm going to find a Jewish hell's angel. He says, that's stupid. How could you believe that, that Jesus is Messiah? He says, what do you believe? And he told me he believed that the devil 
uh, is the savior of the world, that God wanted to give up on man, and the devil said, no, give them to me and I'll love them. So the devil loves us. And that he is our protector and God hates us. And I looked at him going, I bust, I left in his face and says, that's got to be the stupidest thing I've ever heard from the pit of hell. And then he stands up. And I'm like, like I said, that's the stupidest thing. I, I don't know where this bravery came from because I'm not a fighter. Mm -hmm. I have a big mouth. But like I told Pastor Steve, the way I win fights is I bleed on you and you get disgusted <laughs> and walk away. And this guy starts pouring his life out to me. He says, well... I gotta tell you one thing, I'm miserable. I said, you have a, a wife? Nah. The only women in my life are hookers. I said, yeah? And what about family? I don't have a family. I said, so, so the devil's really working for you, I say, huh? So no, actually, no. I said, why don't you have Jesus? Ah, Jesus, they'll never forgive me. And I'm talking to this guy, and I tell him, you can kill me right now. And if Jesus forgave, if you go to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry, he would forgive you. He said, you mean if I take a gun out of my pocket right now and I shoot you, Jesus will forgive me? I said, absolutely. Get out of here. I said, I'll be the first one at the gates to greet you. With him. Come on in, brother. <laughs> and he looked at me and at my stop there, I said, well, I got to get off. And he gets off to stop with me. So I'm walking down the stairs going, well, either he's going to kill me or he's going to walk the other way. <laughs> but I wasn't scared. Because I knew God was leading me to tell this guy Amen. this. It wasn't out being a show off like a tough guy. I'm not the show off tough guy type of guy. I mean, my size did not allow me to be the tough guy. And I said to him, but Jesus loves you and he wants to give you a better life than what you have. He says, are you serious? If I kill you right now, he'll forgive me. I says, go ahead, do it. I'll prove you're right. Go ahead, kill me. He said, that's messed up. And he walked away. And I never saw him again. He lived in my neighborhood. I never saw him again. But his name was David. And I always pray for him. At mm -hmm. least once a week he comes to my mind. Because he saw there was no hope in this world. For us to be the perfect husbands. For us to be the perfect fathers. For us to be the perfect wives. You have to have Messiah first. Amen. Otherwise you're going to be miserable. That man had everything the world would say. Because he had some money. He had a good job. But he was miserable. Hmm. He had a God that, that abandoned him. Mm -hmm. He had a God that turned his back on him, yeah. the devil. Mm -hmm. And I told him, embrace Jesus and he will mm -hmm. give you a life you will never imagine. Mm -hmm. And he walked away saying, that's messed up. Mm -hmm. So, in closing, we've been talking about relationships, husbands and wives. And I don't know why I shared that story, but somebody needed to hear that. When it comes to all boils down to is this. In life, like I said yesterday, we have this crazy world around us and the world goes to so many different things to be its God. Some people turn to drugs, some people turn to alcohol, some people turn to fame, some people turn to money, some people turn to so many different gods out there. Another woman, men leave their wives for another woman because she's younger, she's prettier, she understands me. No, she doesn't. Mm. You idiot. <laughs> Some people will turn to TV, that they'll immerse themselves in their TV shows and they live for that. Some people will immerse themselves in themselves, they become their own God. Some people, their, their depression becomes their God. Some people, their illness becomes their yeah. God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have a God that is anything but Jesus, your God is going to fail you. Amen and amen. Plain and simple, your God is going to fail you. Broadway can't save you. Music can't save you. Your looks definitely can't save you. Because in an instant, that beautiful face and beautiful figure could be gone in a horrific car accident. But only what's done in Messiah, that's what lasts. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinful sand. So my invitation for those watching on Facebook, if you have never had a relationship with God that what I'm talking about. It's more than a relationship. It's a fellowship. Mm -hmm. As close as I am to my wife, I'm closer to Jesus. Amen. Because he's never disappointed me. Not that she's purposely disappointed me, but she's human. Mm -hmm. right, right. He's never disappointed me. I know I've disappointed him mm -hmm. and he's accepted me back with open arms, brushing my head off and saying, okay, Joey, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. 
If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, then I plead with you, do it now. Get on your knees now in your bedroom, in the, wherever you are. If you're listening on a radio in your car, pull over and say, Jesus, I need you now in my life. Come into my heart. Find yourself. Bible believers, a congregation, a church, a home fellowship that's going to make you grow in Messiah and forget what you did in the past. I love how Paul wrote in Philippians, forget what's behind you, but press on for the cross, for, for the prize of the high calling of God. Press on, go forward, forget what you did in the past. Brother Pastor Stephen, it's so good that the past guy, He's dead. Amen. He's gone. Amen. You don't have to remind him, oh Lord, I did this. Why, why bring up the dead? No need to raise up the dead. He's gone. So folks, for those of you here, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, do it today before you leave here because there's no guarantee you're going to make it to your car. Mm -hmm. But there is one guarantee. When we die, we're either going to wind up in a place where there is no exit and it's a place where there's nothing but pain and loneliness well, you're going to wind up in a place where the streets are made out of gold. Amen. A subject that we feel so wonderful and important, so valuable, $1,800 an ounce maybe, I don't know. It's the pavement, it's the asphalt of heaven, yeah. where you're going to be in the presence of God Almighty. His Son Yeshua and the Holy Spirit will envelop you with their love. It's going to be a place that is out of this world. Amen. So if you've never done that, make today that day. Amen, Amen everybody? Amen. Amen. All right. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. I'm sorry if I run you over. Oh, praise God. We're taking a break then. So ladies and gentlemen, we're all take, now taking Amen. a break. It is 20 to 5. Oh, good. Okay. I thought I went too long. You're fine. We're, and we're going to take a 15-minute uh, break. Jordan and I are going to come back.